Welcome to the first Zoom Third Wednesday workshop. My name is Phil Heisel and I'm the technical advisor for the Louisville Genealogical Society. I'm here to assist Nancy with the Zoom utility and help you interact and ask questions via the chat option located at the bottom center of your screen. You may have to move your cursor down to make it visible. Hopefully, if I can determine if any of you have a Zoom problem, I can help you get it solved using the chat option. If you have a question, simply click on the chat option and type in your question. They will be saved in a queue and Nancy and I will go through them at the end of her presentation and she will answer them for you. Your speaker tonight is Ms. Nancy Simmons Robertson. Nancy is a Michigan native. She earned a BA degree in education and did graduate work at Michigan State University. Nancy was a teacher, a coach, and athletic director at Bath Community Schools in Bath, Michigan from 1969 to 2003. Nancy has over 40 years of genealogical research experience specializing in Midwest and New England research. She is a 2020 president of the Louisville Genealogical Society and for the past 12 years has organized and taught internet genealogy classes at various branches of the Louisville Public Library. She's a member of the Detroit Society for Genealogical Research, First Families of Ohio, the John Marshall DAR chapter, and the Kentucky Mayflower Society. I've known Nancy personally for quite a few years now and have always been amazed by her ability to explain things. She's a voracious reader and a dynamo of innate energy. The latter quality has benefited our Louisville Genealogical Society in numerous ways, not the least of which have been her after hours workshops, which have exposed many new genealogists to the joys of finding ancestors and of course, the stories about them. I'm honored to have been chosen by Nancy to introduce her first Zoom workshop, How Do You Start Your Family Research? Nancy? We'll start here. Um, so one of the first questions to ask as a beginner is, why do you do your family history? What is, what, what's the reason you've uh, been attracted to this? Uh, and I want to warn you, it can be an addictive hobby. Uh, so for some people, it's just curiosity. Maybe they've had a death in the family, somebody's left them some photos or a scrapbook, and they want to pursue some history or knowledge on their family. So it could be just purely curiosity that's driving you to start this hobby. Um, some, it's to pass down to their children or their grandchildren a legacy of who they are and their heritage. Um, sometimes it's to preserve family cultures, if you're German, if you're Irish, you're Scottish, to try to find that immigrant, cross him over the pond and find out where he's from, and then maybe get to know more about that culture and the village or the town he came from. Um, so sometimes that's what drives us to start uh, researching our family. Um, sometimes it's we, somebody's asked us to join a lineage society. Um, Two big ones are SAR and DAR, Sons of the American Revolution and um, Daughters of the American Revolution. And you might know through family oral history that you do have a Revolutionary War soldier or maybe a Civil War soldier and you could join a, a Civil War lineage society. Um, so a lot of people are driven to jump into family history because of lineage societies. And there's many, many. You can Google lineage societies and you'll have a list of, I don't know, 130, 140 different societies. So you can always find one that you can fit your ancestors into. Uh, a lineage society usually means you're going to start with yourself and then follow with documentation your lineage back to that person that's, that you need to qualify for that lineage society. So if it's the SAR, you're going to, and you're a gentleman, you're gonna follow back, <clears throat> excuse me, your lineage uh, to somebody in your ancestry, in your family history that fought in the Revolutionary War. So that's often a reason why people jump into genealogy. Um, some people choose to do family history because they wanna publish a book. They wanna put together a book on their surname, uh, maybe to honor their father or grandfather or even their grandmother. And so they're going to research extensively on that surname, 
uh, find documents, put together stories, photos, and do a nice book that they can publish on that family line. So we have lots of reasons why um, we do family history. And sometimes we start with one reason and years down the road, it can switch and we can shift gears and move on to another reason or another goal. So uh, it's an exciting hobby and I'm thrilled that you're here to learn more about that. So one thing that motivates us sometimes to do family research might be an old box of photos. Uh, or a scrapbook somebody has in the family. Um, this is a picture of my mother. And as a young girl, my mother had this box of old pictures I remember looking at. But not until I was like in high school, college, a young adult, I started to wonder about these people. And uh, I love history. And so the history, along with my own ancestors and photos of them, I wanted to know more. Who was this person? What time period is this? What's happening in this picture? So this picture, I'd seen this picture of my mother for years, but then all of a sudden it's like, so mom, what is this picture? We were raised Methodist. What, what is this about? What's the white dress? Well, my mother was raised Roman Catholic. Her mother was an uh, Irish immigrant from Cork County. Um, and this was her first communion. And so it was tradition when they had their first communion to have a professional photograph made of them in their communion garb or her darling little communion dress here that was made by her Irish aunt Kate Cronin who made all the dresses for the girls uh, when they had their first communion. So great story you know you, you, you take a photo and it's a prompt, prompt to bring out more facts and stories about the family. Um, and so my mother was born about 1923, and so uh, there was no date on this picture. And of all those times I talked to my mother, I never put the date on the back, but I assume it's about 1929, 1930, uh, when um, she was about six or seven years old. So just a photograph can drive you to want to jump into doing family research. So it, you might have a photograph or you might have stories about grandpa. So where was grandpa born? You know, what's the background on some of these ancestors of yours? Uh, how many siblings did grandma have? You know, and you may know of one or two, but really how many, how many siblings did she have all together? Did some of them die young? Uh, did some leave the area? Um, and then once you find out about who grandma and grandpa are about, then who are their parents? Who's great grandma and grandpa? Um, what did grandpa do? I have a line of, of relatives in the Detroit area who worked for the railroad. They worked for the New York Central. Uh, and they were anywhere from being um, conductors to engineers. And so um, where did grandpa work? And how long did he work there? And what was his position? And if you're lucky enough, I think it's the 1930 or 40 cents that you can even peek at how much money he made annually. One of those census tells you that. Um, so you want to do a lot of background questions and get information on these ancestors. Uh, what church do they belong to? Or was even grandpa in World War I or World War II? Uh, what's the military? We tend to love the military stories. So those are also something that you can hear the family oral traditions of, but then pursue researching them and finding more. So that takes us to the three goals for tonight's program, how to get started. Uh, the first third uh, part of the program, I'm gonna talk about doing your homework. And I got home in quotes, because um, you're gonna do your work in your home. You're gonna find documents or family items that are going to help you start your research. Um, the second part is gonna be, how do you start organizing then all these facts and these data and the photos and the stories? organization. And each of these probably could be a one hour presentation in itself. So we're, we're not going to go into in depth to a lot of this, but we will touch many points. And then the third uh, point tonight is, uh, so what do you do when you're ready to start your research? Where do you look? Where do you go? So let's start with the very first one. Do your homework. Right? Um, well, before we even get going on this, as a researcher, the cardinal rule 
is you start with yourself. You don't start with that so-called revolutionary war soldier that people think might be a family member and try to come forward. You can often end up barking up wrong trees that way. So you wanna start with you and you wanna do your homework first. So what documents do you have in your home about you? Do you have your birth certificate? That's an excellent document to start with. Now you're not gonna make that public, but you want to make a copy of it and put it with your files. So hopefully when you pass uh, your materials on to somebody else, that document will be there. Um, and that's a good document to start with. It's called a primary document. A primary document is a document that is made at the time of the event. So at your birth, uh, you weren't there to give the information. You were there, so they know the date of your birth. Uh, they know where you're at, so they know the place. Uh, but one of your parents or both of your parents gave the information about them. And oftentimes it asks, it, not often, it will ask the parent's name, unless it's an adoption. Of course, that's an exception of the rule, and that's a whole other presentation. But birth certificates are primary because they were made at the time of the event, and the people involved in that event are there giving the information. So your birth certificate's a very valuable piece of research. And then you might want a baptismal or a confirmation, any kind of church records, um, school records. Or you might want, you know, the other thing you might have in your home is your marriage certificate or your marriage license. So you're gonna look for documents in your home. Uh, the second thing you wanna do is talk to relatives. Um, we call this collaborating. You're gonna start with your closest relatives, but eventually as you stay in this hobby, you'll be collaborating with second and third cousins that you've never met. Um, so we're gonna to talk to relatives and see what they can offer. And then we're gonna look at all those sources you have in your home. So let's look at that. Here's your home and what might you have? Um, you might have a family Bible. Do you have your parents' family Bible? Do you have a Bible that you started as a child that might have some of your uh, religious events recorded in it. I might have your birth recorded. Um, journal, do you have any journals? Uh, journals are kind of interesting. Um, I have a journal of a great grandfather and the journal keeps track of the temperature or the weather every day, how many eggs he collected, and what they planted in the garden or what they're harvesting out of the garden. So it wasn't too personal. In fact, his son dies, which is my grandfather, when he's 31 years old of pneumonia. And on the date of his death, my grand, great-grandfather doesn't even talk about the death. So oftentimes journals uh, have irrelevant facts as far as a researcher, but they add to your story as you progress, as you start to put together the facts, then you wanna start putting the stories together around your ancestors. Uh, school records, uh, you have report cards, graduation announcements, anything like that is valuable. A photo album is very valuable. And if somebody passed down a photo album to you with photos with actually information, that's even better yet. But those photos that aren't identified, this is where you start collaborating with cousins to find out who are these people, okay? What's their relationship to grandma and grandpa? Uh, so photographs are good. Baby books, baby books are great. Uh, if your parents were, uh, had the time and the effort to put together a baby book for you, maybe they'll have a lock of your hair. They might have uh, what you look like the day you were born. Uh, sometimes baby books have the beginnings of a family tree in them. Uh, so that could give you some really good information. Uh, marriage records, scrapbooks. Oh, scrapbooks are great. Um, I didn't have any relatives who actually kept scrapbooks like this, but I visited historical museums where women would put scrapbooks together where they clip obits and marriage announcements out of the local paper and put them together in a scrapbook. Uh, and then years later, that scrapbook was donated to the historical or the genealogy society. So boy, it's lovely if your family has one of those. And then we don't think about it, deed records. Uh, you have uh, any information on the houses that you've purchased or maybe your parents have purchased uh, my parents left the city of Detroit. They sold their house in 1960, and I have the real estate card. It's a punch card, and it's got how many bedrooms, the size of the rooms, 
what they sold the house for, uh, what it was, what the taxes were. So again, that's what adds um, meat to your story. Uh, the data is the bones of your story, but when you find these other stories, you're putting fat on the bones, okay? You're, you're adding meat to it. So look around your home as a beginning researcher and see what you have, can find. Um, and this won't end. Even as experienced researchers, we continue to look for these items. Um, you never know who's going to come up with the family Bible. You may not even know one exists and then find some second cousin that's got the family Bible that belonged to your great grandparents. So uh, this is an ongoing adventure as far as pursuing uh, records from homes. So here's what you're looking for. Any kind of record that might have a birth, date, marriage, death, school activities, religious activities, employment. Um, I have my grandfather's social security card. Um, I have his Masonic temple membership card. I have his ring, which goes under household items. So even items like rings and jewelry or furniture, you want to take digital pictures of them and they will add to your story uh, as you put together more and more on your family. Uh, military service records, land and property we talked about, health records, um, citizenship pa papers. Maybe you uh, uh, have an ancestor that's only one or two generations away from immigrate to the United States. Do you have their naturalization papers or citizenship papers? If you do, you're very fortunate and treasure them and take digital copies of them and then preserve them in archival paper. So you're going to do your homework here. So here's an example of a secondary source. Remember the primary source was the birth certificate that was recorded at the time of the event with those involved in the event. I'm gonna to talk to you about secondary sources. Um, I have my mother's grandmother. Her name was Nina Wilcott. She's the second child on this birth record. And she, um, her mother was Margaret, Smith, you love that, who married Jacob Wilcox. And that's who this picture is of. This is Margaret, my great-great-grandmother, holding her first son, Hubbard. And if you look at her dress and her hairstyle, you pretty well can guess this is mid-19th century. Uh, but one thing about this uh, Bible record that makes it a secondary source and not a primary is the handwriting. As you examine this source, it was in the middle of the family Bible, uh, and I took a picture of this page. Um, you notice that they're all written pretty much with the same handwriting and in the same uh, tool, same pen was used to write them all. So they weren't entered as the child was born. Okay, these were all entered at one time. So I'm assuming um, that Blanche, the, the last child listed there, who was born in 1881, the Bible belonged to her. So I'm assuming that the Bible was given to her probably as she got married about 1901, and she filled in the history of her siblings. And so this is a good source. It's a great document to have, and census records will confirm it. And then if I look for death records for these people, it should also have their birth date on it, and this would substantiate this secondary source. Most of these people born in the mid-1800s, especially in Michigan, there were not birth records. So Kentucky has got some that start, I think, 1852, but they're sparse. Uh, the majority of good, are, uh, what do I want to say, uh, where you get the most uh, birth records recorded is sometime between 1900 and 1915 is when states started demanding that birth records had to be kept. Uh, so Bible records tend to be a really good source. So here's a picture of the birth page out of the family Bible. I also have a picture of the front page of the family Bible, and I want to write uh, the story behind the family Bible. Who owned it? Who, how did I get possession of it? It went from my Aunt Blanche to my grandfather to my mother, who's named after Blanche, and then to me. So you want to get uh, the Provence of, of the Bible. And then uh, this picture, and there were many others. This was a tintype picture. So I, I took the photos and digitized them, and then I 
put the uh, tintypes in an archival box. So let's move on and look at uh, some other things you want to do. Uh, once you've started gathering documents, you're going to find out you're visiting other members of the family. So you want to start interviewing those family members. Okay, interview is a good way to uh, pull information uh, from family members. And so really the first ones you on the top of your list should be your oldest family members. In fact, we had a member in our society who shared with us a month ago where his mother uh, was in her 90s. Uh, she kind of, um, she has Alzheimer's, but you know, Alzheimer's do real good most of the time doing very early um, memory. So he was there and he recorded some stories that she was remembering at the time uh, that he had never heard and he was recording them. And just this week he announced, he proceeded to send me an email to say his mother had passed away. So you want to make sure you grab those oldest family members as soon as possible. Um, and then kind of, if your grandparents are still living, interview them or aunts and uncles or cousins. And then People that forget this, really good friends of the family. We had friends of the family we called Uncle Bob and Aunt Ruth. They weren't even related. It's my dad's best friend. And so he could share many family stories because he was around the family. Um, so you want to interview those kind of people to get stories and facts. Um, and the picture here shows the woman holding a small tape recorder. Uh, but aren't we lucky now? Uh, so much luckier than in the 80s where I had to carry my camera with film in it and take the pictures and hope they turned out. My grandmother wouldn't even let the photo album leave her house. So I had to take the pictures through the plastic coated pictures. And now we can take our phones in, we can interview people with our phones and we can digitize records or photos they have. So always travel with that phone or digital camera and start thinking about who you want to interview and as you travel and go to family events, um, think about what you want to do or who you want to interview. And so here's some interviewing questions. Okay, um, you want to think ahead a little bit. What kind of stories, who are you interviewing and then what kind of stories or what kind of information would you like to get from them? So you want to think about where either of your grandparents in the military. Um, if they were, you might want to interview their, uh, you know, interview stories about the military. My niece was going to college and interviewed my father about what it was like for him in 1942 to graduate from high school in January. They had a January graduating class. He turned 18 the same day, and the next day he got his draft notice to leave, uh, of course, for World War II. Um, this was, I guess, 1943. And uh, he was to report in um, March for his physical. So for two months, uh, my mother who lived two doors down from him and they were dating, they couldn't go anywhere. Uh, there had been a race riot in Detroit and there was a curfew. And so every evening they would sit on the porch and talk. Uh, and that's, he shared that in this interview with my niece. None of us had known about that story. And so um, ask military questions can prompt all kinds of um, stories. Uh, ask them about their earliest childhood memory. Um, do they uh, remember what family dinner traditions they had? So you can come up with all kinds of prompts. Um, sometimes your relatives can kind of start going off on tangents, so it's nice to have a prompt that you can rein them back in. Uh, you don't really want to cut them short. Those stories are precious. But if there's something you really want to get to, you know, there's stories you really want to know about, um, you want to have some prompts to help you get there. Okay, so we, we've done our homework and we've started collecting all this data. And now what do we do with this data? And what do we do with these facts? So two things that you're gonna learn about, two charts that beginning genealogists are introduced to is a pedigree chart and a family group sheet. So I have to go back. Remember the first thing I said, you start with yourself. So you're gonna do a pedigree chart. They also call these ancestral charts. Maybe pedigree chart refers too much to that racehorse pedigree. <laughs> I guess I've been in Kentucky too long here, but I know reference if you Google pedigree charts or family group charts, 
you can Google and find where there's free ones that you can download. Um, I suggest to beginners to print out a pedigree and a family group chart to start with. I'm trying to go, I am a digital person and I do do a lot and we'll talk about digital records in a minute. Uh, but there's something about having a piece of paper in front of me with a pencil as I'm starting to brainstorm and put things together or pull data together. So a pedigree chart is where you're gonna start with yourself and you're gonna start with the present and go to the past. So you're gonna start with yourself, put your birth and your marriage if you're married. And then you're gonna go to your parents and you're gonna go from the known facts you have to your parents to blanks on information you really don't know. Do you know dad was born in uh, Bullock County, Kentucky, but do you know where in Bullock County? Was he born at home? Was he born at grandma's house? Okay, so there's gonna be some spaces and that's gonna help you develop a research plan eventually. Um, so after you do you, you do your parents and you're gonna to go to your grandparents and you wanna see if you know their birth dates, their birthplace, and then document where you found that information. You know, did you get that out of a family Bible? Is it just by hearsay by somebody? So then you, you'd mark it as you've gotta find a document that's gonna verify that. Marriage, death, and burial. And then you can add other facts too, but those are the primary ones you're looking for. So here's an example of a pedigree chart. Um, there's various kinds. Uh, this one has uh, abbreviations down here for birth, and then where is the birth, marriage, where was the marriage, death, and where was that death. And you're gonna start with yourself. This does have your spouse on it, but your spouse is really not part of your pedigree. This is bloodline, and your spouse does not have your bloodline. So it's really you and then your parents, and then you go to your grandparents, and then you're gonna back up to great grandparents. Notice the exponential factor here. You go from two parents to four grandparents to eight great. When you get over here to two greats, you've got 16, get to three greats. Uh, but as a beginner, you're just gonna to try to fill in maybe the first three or four generations here, okay? And what facts do you know? And where did you get those facts? So this is your true pedigree and your lineage line. And when you fill out your pedigree chart, of course, I can't say it enough, you start with yourself. And then the second big thing is women are always listed with their maiden name. Um, as a family researcher, you have to learn to do this. It's her bloodline. Her married name is not her bloodline. So we, we do believe in marriages and we understand that, but when you're doing family research, you want every woman listed with their maiden name. So you wanna find out what their given name is, if they have a given middle name, and then put the woman's maiden name. Um, and so I've given you some examples of how you should do this. So here is Leo Burton Martin. This is his, first, his given name and middle name. Some researchers, put the surname in all caps. This is your preference. But whatever you do, make consistent. I don't capitalize the surnames, but many people do. And then when you write the dates, you wanna put the day and then the month, and you put the three letter abbreviation for that month, and then put the year. This is a universal dating system that's used with uh, genealogy. The day, the month, three letter abbreviation, and then the year. And then you wanna write the place that they were born uh, with the village or the town or the city, then the county, and then the state. And as a beginner, it's nice to make decisions like uh, right now, are you gonna write the state out completely as you record everything, or are you gonna use abbreviations? Either is fine, but just be consistent. If you don't know the town and the village and you just know they were born in Gratiot County, then I would put Gratiot and include the word county and then put Michigan. And then once, maybe if you find out where in the small town of Ashley, then you're gonna take that county out. And right away when you have three uh, places listed here, this would be the town or the village or the township. This would be the county and the third fact would be the state. Uh, some people even add the United States. They put another comma because if you're researching back, uh, deep into German or Irish research, you're eventually gonna add you know, Ireland in there or Germany. 
So this is how you would start your pedigree chart. So let's look at a pedigree chart I pulled out of my software. Um, this pedigree chart doesn't have a whole lot of information on it. My family group sheets do have much more, but it has their birth, their marriage, and their death. Uh, notice Cleo over here, this is my mother-in-law. Uh, it's her maiden name, Martin. Her father's last name is Martin, and the Martin line follows the top branch there. Uh, her mother has her maiden name here, Johnston. And then you do her parents, uh, and then her grandparents. So this is the start of your pedigree chart. And the next step is to go to family group sheets. So you would take Cleo, and her husband is up here, and you would put them on a family group sheet and list their children and start putting data and information about their children. Then you would do a family group sheet with Leo and Hazel. And then you would do one with Thomas and Ida. And then Lemuel and Murdy. And so then you're going to collect family group sheets uh, to put alongside of this pedigree chart. So let's talk about how you fill out a family group sheet. You're going to fill out a chart for each couple on your pedigree chart. And you want to get information about those parents and then the children of that family. Remember, you're related to one of those children. Uh, if you're starting with your parents, you would be listed with your siblings. Um, so there's always a direct child that you have a direct line, your direct line is through. Uh, and where are you going to get all this information? Well, you're going to Pull it from family Bibles, baptismal records, marriage certificates. And a lot of times you know the date and the place, but you don't have a document yet. So that's going to be on your to-do list as a genealogist, is to find a document to support that data. You can't just say, because Grandma said, you got to find some uh, viable document that supports it. So here's a blank family group sheet. Here you have um, information at the very top is just about the person who's recording it. This is put out by Ancestry. So if you have a subscription, and even if you don't, you can go to Ancestry, click on genealogy, and then um, under help. You don't even have to have a subscription. And under help, you put in family charts or put in family group sheet or pedigree, and you come up with these charts, print them out. So you're gonna put the husband's name, all his data, where he was born, the place. And then over here, I've never had a chart that says this. It asks, actually asks the name of the church he was christened in, name of the church he was married in, uh, cause of death. So this has quite a bit of information uh, on it that you fill in together. Um, then you're going to do the wife. And notice here they remind you to do the maiden name. Most don't. And then you're going to come down here and put the children and put their information, birth, place of birth, the beginnings of their spouses who they marry, and then their dates and places. And then eventually you're gonna have a family group sheet for every one of these children. So you're gonna start collecting quite a bit of paper. And this is where you might say, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't wanna do all this paper. So there's two school of thoughts on organizing. There are those who have been doing research for years and years and have used paper, and that's what they like. Are comfortable and they keep collecting paper, putting it in binders, uh, notebooks, file cabinets. That's what they're comfortable with. So that's what they do. I'm kind of, uh, and then there's the whole digital world. And younger people today, they're jumping in and just going straight to, let's say, ancestry, start building their trees and creating these family charts and pedigree charts on a digital tree. So there's that way too, I'm kind of in between. I'm still trying to take all my 1980 and 90 research that's on paper in my binders and converting it over to my digital records. So I live kind of in both worlds, but I'd say it's more 80 20, I'm 80% digital. So you need to make this decision too, but I'd say to start with, print out some paper, uh, pedigree charts, and family group sheets to get started. And then you've got them when you start using uh, some software. We're going to talk about that. So here's an example of a family group sheet. It's dates. Notice you got the day, the month, and the year. 
and you've got uh, Ozark, Dale, Alabama. Here we don't have a, a city or a town, so it's just Dade County. And it's got what his occupation is. He was in World War I. Here's his parents' names. And then here's his wife, Floyd Ivy McCumber, and her data. And then we've got the children. What's missing here is a lot of dates. So uh, we don't have all that information yet, but this person's putting together what they know, and then they're going to search for the unknown. So this would be a example of a family group chart. So yeah, can you feel the paper mounting? Uh, and then the problem is, where is that family group sheet? Uh, how can I find it? Um, you know, there's all kinds of videos and lectures on how to organize using the paper. You can go by stickers and different colored folders, and there's all kinds of methods for getting organized using paper. So if that's the route you want to take, I strongly recommend um, Google Organization of Genealogy you know, records and see if you can't find one that will explain to you their technique and you can modify it to fit your needs. Uh, but we're going to look at both paper and digital. So the first is let's talk about genealogy software. Okay, this is the digital world. Um, what do you want to do with your data? As you're collecting all of this, you want to store it on your computer. You want to be able to take digital pictures and stories and files and store them on your computer. Uh, maybe you're preparing all this to write a book or maybe you just want to share it with your family. Uh, but you might want to consider, and I strongly recommend you consider, using genealogy software. So that takes you to another decision you have to make and that is do you buy software for your personal computer or do you use web-based software? All this time, I start looking out at my crowd when I'm teaching at the library to see if I got you all awake. But I hope you're all uh, stretch here. Take a stretch, move those hands, take a drink of water. We'll take a little break here and hopefully wake you up. So computer software came out, I would say, in the mid 80s, 1980s. That was when I purchased my first shareware, uh, and I'm still using it. It's called Brothers Keeper, and you load it on your personal computer, and all your information is kept on your personal computer. Uh, when I would travel to do research at a library, I would print out pedigree charts or family group sheets on the families I wanted to research and take them with me. And then when I came home, I had to enter all that data into my computer. You can still do that. There's still a lot of software out there where you keep confined to your computer, desktop, laptop. Now more and more we're using, you know, iPads and software, uh, I mean, laptops, and we can travel with our computers with us. And so you can have your software on your laptop and take it with you to the library, which that was the next level. Uh, but just in the last 10 years, we've gotten to the second option and that's web-based software. And that's where you're going to use, um, and there's free and paid sites where you can do this. You're going to start building your tree on the computer who stores it on the cloud. Okay. Now, as you start doing all this work, there's a big concern on the safety of your research and backing it up. So if you're keeping your um, data on software that's on your personal computer, you need to think about, excuse me, how you're going to back that up. Once a month, are you gonna do a backup to a hard drive, to a flash drive? Um, you need to figure out a way, because you don't wanna spend a year or two gathering all this data and then have your computer crash or some sort of natural disaster come through and you lose it all. You wanna think of how you're gonna do a backup. Now, the beauty of web-based software is it's backed up automatically. It's saved on some huge computer database system and warehouses in probably California or who knows where, uh, and they have backups to their data. And so the beauty of web-based is you can go anywhere and access it, get on any computer with your ID and your password, access your tree, and it's being backed up all the time. So let's continue a little bit more of this. 
So personal software you might put on your computer. Um, you want to store your software on your computer and you're going to enter your data, your birth, your death, your marriages, your places, all that information you had on your pedigree chart and on your family group sheets. You can also attach pictures. So that's kind of nice. And I take a lot of photos that are documents. But, you know, I use my camera to take pictures of, of death records and, and cemetery records. And then I upload those to my computer and store them on my software. Uh, you back up your data. We talked about that. And then some of the more familiar software, I use one called Brothers Keeper here. That's what this icon over here, the blue B is. It's not a very popular one, but it's the one I started on. I've been working on it for years. And there are a couple other LGS members who do have Brothers Keeper, um, which is something to think about. When you're thinking of purchasing software, try to find a support system for that software. They all have a, a computer, I mean, a support system that you can call or email to. But to me, that's one of the reasons I joined a genealogy society, is to network with other genealogists and talk to them about their software. And then if I have problems, I can ask like Phil, who introduced me tonight, he uses Brothers Keeper and I can share with him any problems or how does he do this with Brothers Keeper. If you have another relative or a cousin that does research, ask them, what kind of software do you use? And you might want to think of using the same kind. So then you can exchange ideas and exchange problems and troubleshoot for each other. Um, so here's a list of four popular ones. Family Tree Maker is probably the most popular personal software out there. Brothers Keeper is the one I use. Uh, Legacy Family Tree is very popular in Roots Magic. Now there's many more. All you have to do is Google. You know, personal um, computer software for genealogy. And you'll, uh, reviews of genealogy software, and they'll bring it up and show you all the features, although most of them all have similar features. But there's some that are a little more unique. Some you can use on Windows and Apple. Um, so if you do use Apple products, you might want to make sure you <laughs> research and look at the ones that can be used with an Apple computer. There's also in the last few years, we've come up with software that we call synchronization software. It means you load it onto your computer and then you can belong to Ancestry, which is a paid subscription site, or you can use Family Search, which is free. We're going to talk more about them in a little bit. Uh, but as you're using them and you're finding records, okay, let's say you find grandpa's death certificate for 1910 in Bullock County, Kentucky and you've downloaded it, okay? At the same time you put it on your tree on Ancestry, you can also put it into Family Tree Maker, your software that's on your computer. So it synchronizes with both. Uh, so this has been a whole new um, positive move in the field of genealogy software, is synchronized software. Uh, Family Tree Maker cost, I think about $80, and it is the most popular, it's one of the more expensive ones. But there's a lot of people who use it, so you could probably network with a lot of others. Roots Magic is another one. It costs about $30. It does synchronize with Ancestry and Family Search, and it has all the basic needs that you would need. And then the third one I have listed here is Legacy. It costs just a little bit more than Roots Web, but one of its um, perks is it has extensive charts. If you're a person who likes to create, make charts, you might want to look at legacy. Now you can go to any of these, um, familytreemaker.com, rootsmagic.com, and download a free sample. They'll allow you to put so many names in and use it for so long, and then you have to purchase it at that, a certain point. So uh, look at the reviews, talk to some other genealogists, or join a genealogy society and network with those fellow genealogists, ask them about what software they use, and um, try downloading a couple and see which ones you like. Also, legacy, I forgot to mention, it only synchronizes with family search, does not synchronize with Ancestry. So if you're a person who's not going to invest in Ancestry, which you can do a lot of research without paying Ancestry, 
um, legacy might be a good one because it does uh, synchronize the family search. So let's talk about web-based software. This is where you're gonna get on your computer, go to a website, sign in with your um, ID and your password, and then you can, e usually most of these, you can build your trees and you can search for records. Now, some of these sites get a lot of poo-poo and there's negative talk because people pull information from, you can look at other people's trees that they've made public. You can make your tree public and let everybody look at it so you can collaborate or you can make it private so nobody can see it. Some people just grab information off of trees without documentation. That's where you get in trouble. But you can get leads looking at other people's trees. Somebody might have that grandpa was born in Mason County, Kentucky in 1852. Well, then you can start looking for that. Was the family in Mason County in 1860? Are they on the census? Can you find a death record that states that? So sometimes a tree can give you a lead, but you don't want to just take anything off of somebody's tree unless it's documented or verified. So anyways, back to web base. You could use Ancestry. Um, if you have a paid subscription, you can load and build trees. You can go to the libraries and use the library edition of Ancestry free. You can go to the Family History Center and use it free. And interesting, because of COVID-19 right now, Ancestry has a policy where only users can go into a library, into the brick and mortar building to access their library edition. But since COVID-19, all libraries have made Ancestry available online. So right now, you can go home tonight, access, if you have your library card and a password for the local library, you can access Ancestry. If you don't, you might wanna look into getting that library card and getting a password so you can use their uh, online data. Most of them have Ancestry, which would be free right now. How long it's going to stay that way, we don't know. My Heritage is another paid subscription site uh, where you can build trees and find records. Both Ancestry and My Heritage also have a DNA component. You can test and load your DNA in and connect that way too. That's a whole nother uh, multi-lectured series on DNA and, and, and family research. But Ancestry and My Heritage have those uh, perks. Now, Family Search is a free site, and I strongly recommend that's a good place to start. You can build a tree for free, you can access records for free, you can collaborate with others. Now, their tree is very unique, and I do a whole two hour workshop on Family Search, but you might want to look at that to start as a, as a newbie uh, to look at Family Search. You do have to register. Uh, because it's an interactive site for security reasons, but it doesn't cost you anything. You can access all the census records and many, many other records. So those are web-based. And remember the beauty of web-based is I could travel um, up to Michigan and be at my sister's house and say, hey, let me show you what I just found on great grandma. And I can, get on her computer and use my ID and password and get right into all my trees and my data. So you have it wherever you go. But if you carry your laptop with you, you can do the same thing. So it's just a matter of personal preference. So you have personal computer software that you keep just on your computer. If you have laptops and tablets, you can put them on those and carry it with you, or you can do web-based. Big decisions. Now you're ready to build your trees. You, you know how to gather your data, what you're looking for. You know that you want to start with yourself and then work backwards, okay, to grandma and grandpa, to great grandma and grandpa. And then you want to start looking for the data that you don't have or data that you have without documents and see if you can start finding those documents. So here's a, a few pointers on where you should start. All beginners should start with what we call your census research. Okay, you've talked to mom and dad, you have their births, and most of our parents were born and existed in 1940. And so they would be on a 1940 census. But if you notice on my first line here, census records started 
in 1790. And they are taken every 10 years. And the most recent census that's made public, we have a 70 years privacy act, is 1940. The 1950 census, I think, will be released in 2023. So census records are excellent place to start. Now, here's another couple pointers here on census. The 1850, the 1860, and the 1870 start listing the entire household. So we've got to back up a little bit. If we look at a 1790, 1800, all the way up to 1840, the census record only consists of the head of the household, so it's gonna be daddy's name, and then little tick marks for how many boys were ages five to 10, 20 to 30, 40 to 40, 40 to 50. Each census has a little bit different age uh, difference, but there's just tick marks. The only name you would see on those early census records is the head of the household. Now, if daddy died and mom is the head of the household, you will then see a woman's name. Okay, when you get to 1850, they start listing everybody's name in that house. So they got mama, daddy, and maybe six children. The problem is we don't know if those children are really their children in the 1850, 60, and 70s. It could be younger siblings. It could be nieces or nephews. It could be neighbors with the same name. Who knows? But uh, we do have all the names in those census that are living under that house, under that roof. When we get to the 1880 census and go through 1940, they started listing relationships. So the head of the household would be daddy, then his wife would be listed. It would be her name and it's going to say wife. And then his children would be listed and it will say son or daughter. Sometimes it says G daughter, granddaughter. Maybe it's a niece. Maybe it's a boarder. They'll tell you the relationship. So when you start your census research, you want to start the same way we've been doing everything, with the most recent. So you would start with your parents or your grandparents and do the 1940 census. <clears throat> Excuse me. <coughs> um, and then you would back up to the 1930. And as you back up, you're going to get them buried with children. Then you're going to get them as a child living with their parents. So now you have the parents. You keep backing up till you find those parents as children. And so census work is uh, the essence of a beginner's research plan. You want to do your census work. So where do you do your census work? Well, you can go to the paid sites, Ancestry or MyHeritage, or you can go to the free sites. You can go to Family Search and Heritage Quest. Let me speak just a little bit to that. Heritage Quest is a database. Uh, that has all the census records, that has historical and county digital books. It's got Revolutionary War records. And usually it is a database that is purchased and used by uh, educational institutions, libraries, schools, colleges, universities. And so you have to have, uh, most of the time we're gonna use it through a library and you have to have your library card and a password and then at home you go to the library site you go to their resources for genealogy and you click on heritage quest put in your 16 digit card number your password and you can access all the census records in fact guess who's powering those census records it's exactly the same records that people are paying what, 300 dollars a year to belong to ancestry so um or maybe it's 200 for the U.S. records and 300 for the world records. I have it. I'm not quite sure right now, but they're paying big bucks for Ancestry. You can use it free through your library on Heritage Quest. You can also go to your Family History Center. I'll tell you about that here before we finish up. So you're going to start your census research, okay? And you're going to start finding uh, your ancestors, backing them up in each census, how old they are. It tells where they were born. Tell us what daddy did for a living, his occupation, uh, if they immigrated, what year. Census records have a lot of information to help you fill in those pedigree and family group sheets. <clears throat> so remember we talked about documentation. As you're documenting, if you pull off an 1850 census, 
The author would be the federal government. The title would be the 1850 Federal Census for Danville, Vermilion County, Illinois, if that's where I was pulling my information from. The publisher might be Ancestry if they're posting it, or Heritage Quest. Repository, if it's a book that you pulled off of a county library, you're gonna put the name of the library. Uh, and then you want the page number, the volume number, and maybe even the date you found it. This is so you could go back. If all of a sudden you realize, you know, I wonder who their neighbors were and if that's where my aunt is living, right next door. So you might wanna go back and here you would know how to get right back to that page so you could do it. It also verifies your information. So you wanna start documenting every time. Um, when you use the digital format, like on Ancestry, when you plug in the 1850 census to your tree, it automatically documents it for you. So that's the, also the beauty, that's why you pay $200 for that subscription. They do some of the work for you. Okay, so you've done your homework, uh, you've organized, you've decided what kind of software you're going to use, and now you want to start researching and you've done your census work. Now I'm taking you here to the next step on research. You want to start researching at maybe libraries. Uh, again, libraries would have websites too that you can utilize all libraries pretty much all have ancestry that you can access um you want to join some societies if uh you live here in louisville it's nice to join the louisville uh, society but if you live let's say you're visiting tonight and you live in columbus ohio you might want to look at what the local societies there are so you can plug into what they have when we get back to on-site get-togethers um i also join societies where my ancestors are from so my father's family is from Vermilion County, Illinois, and I joined that local society there. I belong to the Detroit Genealogy Society because that's where the meat of my family came from. So you might want to join some other ones to get their quarterlies, their journals, um, and to maybe even plug in nowadays with Zoom meetings that are offered free through a lot of these societies. County resources, you want to look at county libraries, county courthouses. Then you're going to move to state libraries and historical centers uh, and state archives. You want to move to national libraries and national organizations. And of course, we've already talked about websites, but there's many, many internet genealogy websites. That's a whole other workshop too, all the websites where you can research. So this is the Louisville Free Public Library. Well, really, uh, the picture is of the SAR. So here's the uh, the libraries that are here in Louisville. We are very fortunate in Louisville. We have a great public library system when it's open. It's closed right now. Uh, and that's why you can use Ancestry free at home. Um, but it has a wonderful genealogy section downtown at the main branch up on the second floor. They've just remodeled and put that together. It's really lovely. We have a family history center that is sponsored through the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints. And that's here in Louisville on Hurstbourne. We also have the national headquarters for the Sons of the American Revolution. We have the Filson Club, which is a private historical club, and they have a library. You have to pay to use it, but it's a lovely library for Ohio Valley research. And then we live on the border of Indiana, so you can cross the river and go over to the New Albany Public Library, or the Jefferson County Library. So you want to check out libraries as you start researching. Um, <clears throat> This is just the plug that kind of said most of this information. When you get on um, the website for your local library and go to resource materials, many times they have local newspapers that are digitized. And what can you find there? Obituaries, yes, with death dates and sometimes pictures. Um, Ancestry is often provided through public libraries, unless it's a real small, economically deprived library system, Ancestry is usually on most, uh, in most libraries, public libraries. Heritage Quest is also a database you can find in most public libraries. Here's the Louisville Family History Center. Now, if you don't live in Louisville, there is a Family History Center somewhere near you. Uh, I'm going to hopefully show you how you can look that up, but you would go to familysearch.org and go to help and you can find a local family history center. I like to look them up too when I travel. 
When I go to West Virginia, I want to know where the local family history center is. They have films there, they people that are knowledgeable on research, they can head you out to where cemeteries are at, tell you who to connect with, if there's any genealogy or historical libraries in the area besides theirs. Great place to plug into when you travel to find out what's in the area. And here's the hours, this is on your handout. <coughs> uh, if we ever get back to, quote, what used to be normal. Uh, this is closed right now due to COVID. The Filson Historical Society uh, has an online catalog, and if you are dyed in the wool, Kentucky, Southern Indiana, you wanna plug into the, Hill, the Filson and see what they have. They have family group sheets. Uh, when you go into them, I don't think they're online, but uh, you can go in and they have files on different family names that they'll pull and let you look at. Excuse me. So the Filson Historical Society, if you're a Louisvillian, if not, you're from another area, what are some historical societies in your area? Check and see, many of them connect with a genealogy aspect to their society. So the Louisville Genealogy Society, what do you get by joining uh, a society? Uh, usually they put out newsletters or quarterlies. We put out both of those. We have a lovely quarterly that comes out every three months with people's research, how they break brick walls, uh, indexes to uh, probate records in certain counties, um, a lot of information that helps you research in this area. And then really good how-to articles. Uh, they bring in speakers, they do workshops like we're doing tonight. We sponsor a fall seminar with a national speaker. And then many societies make trips and so you can travel with a group of fellow genealogists. What fun is that? I always call it going to genealogy camp. Uh, we make a spring trip up to Fort Wayne, third week in May, and then we've traditionally gone third week in September to Salt Lake City. Not sure if that's gonna happen this year, but um, it is really uh, fun to go with a group of genealogists who can help you troubleshoot and you, Salt Lake City is, you know, genealogy mecca. Um, so advantages of joining a society. Allen County Public Library is up in Fort Wayne, Indiana. It's the second largest genealogical collection in the U.S. and it is the biggest, the largest public library genealogy collection. And it's only four hours away from us. Uh, many groups, when I lived in Michigan, we would board a bus at six in the morning, drive two and a half hours to get to Fort Wayne, research till eight o'clock at night, board the bus, grab McDonald's, I think in those days, and we get home about 11. Um, it's a great place to research. They have a huge collection all over the United States, just not Indiana. They have a room for Indiana, but then they have a room that's about four or five times larger with all the rest of the U.S. Uh, they have Europe, they have a lot of uh, European records, Asian records. It is wonderful and it's much closer to get to than Salt Lake City. So you might want, and they have a great website. If you have not checked out the website for the Allen County Public Library, you need to go to it. It has very good databases that you can access. They have a great Bible collection where family Bibles have been scanned or people have sent them in digitally. digitally. They have uh, family books that have been digitized. Uh, check out this website. The Family History Center in Salt Lake City is the largest. These are pictures of it. The whole second floor is those bookcases. Uh, they have one whole floor of nothing but computers. Uh, and what's nice about the Family History Center in Salt Lake City and like public libraries, they have many, many people to help you. Public libraries, uh, their funding is lacking, and they're lucky if they have one or two people on the genealogy floor, or even in the genealogy section, might as well somebody to help you. Uh, family History Center in Salt Lake, or even your local Family History Center here in Louisville, or wherever you live, uh, there are patrons there to help you. Um, research how to use a website. They have many paid websites you can use free. So I encourage you to find where your local history, family history center is. Don't have to travel to Salt Lake. Well, you should eventually plan a trip there. County research. You wanna to go to courthouses and county libraries. Um, those courthouses have, you know, 
most valuable. If you can get to your courthouses, if they're local or not too far of a drive. Um, if they are, for example, I have people in Kansas and Iowa, it's better for me to go to familysearch.org and find those records than it is for me to drive out to the courthouse um, in Kansas or Iowa. But it's always fun to make those trips. You can visit cemeteries, you can get pictures of the courthouses, try to find out where the family homestead is. Um, and your local library might have those family files, cemetery books. You might have somebody that might know where those cemeteries are at so you can get to them. So you want to check out county resources. State resources. Uh, the Kentucky State Library and Archives is a wonderful source of information. Of course, it's closed right now. You can check their catalog. All of these have catalogs online. So you can go check and see what they have available. Um, and then the State Historical Society has a room. Um, they have a huge, huge collection of family files, uh, from mainly from Kentucky, but the whole Ohio River Valley area. Um, but no matter what state you live in, you want to check out your state library, your state archives, see what they have online right now. And um, you might be surprised. National Library, you've got the Library of Congress. Oh, need some editing there. Uh, library of Congress is the largest library in the world. Uh, what I like is their map collection and they have a great photograph if you're trying to find a to beef up a book that you're making and you need photos, usually the Library of Congress has photos that you can use that are, uh, what's the word I want to use? Um, you have permission to publicly use them and their maps. The DAR Public Library, or not public, it's a private library, it's in Washington, D.C. It's a beautiful library. If you're going to Washington, D.C., you want to visit that as a genealogist. Of course, the National Archives is on, all of these are in Washington. Um, so there are trips people make to go just to Washington, D.C. Uh, and research in these three uh, archives or repositories. Um, but not right now. Hopefully they'll all be open and functioning again. So here's your free genealogy websites. It's on your um, handout. Heritage Quest, again, is through your library. Family Search is a free site sponsored through the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints, but it has a huge collection of free um, digital records, probate records, wills, um, births, deaths. Um, you'd be amazed. Go to their wiki. Uh, hopefully, you'll come back and come to one of my uh, two-hour lectures on just Family Search and how to use. It. Oh, it's a great place to store photos too. They have a memory area where you can upload and store pictures and access them anywhere and it's a great backup for all your photos. US Gen Web is an older site but it still has some sections of it's pretty good. Um, there's Find a Grave and then the big plug I want to make is social media, Facebook. Some people forget to do this. You can go to Facebook and look at, um, oh what did I just look up? West Virginia Ritchie County Genealogy and they have a whole web page of my all my cousins in West Virginia that plug in and put pictures and will research and help you out and tell you about cemeteries. So put the county that your relatives are from and the word genealogy or historical and see if they have a Facebook page. Usually you have to uh, subscribe to belong, uh, but that's real easy. You just hit the subscribe button and then somebody looks it over and says, yep, you're in. Um, so check uh, Facebook out for, uh, genealogy, county, and even surname. They even have surname pages for people. So check out Facebook. Here's your paid subscription websites. Ancestry, of course, is uh, the largest genealogical records online. I don't know about that statement because um, family search is probably even larger. But Ancestry has a, a world collection too. So does family search. Um, you have to, I think it's close to 200 for the US records, 300 for the world records. So if you want to do European research uh, or even Canada, my husband has Canadian ancestors, so I have to pay that extra 100. I pick what year I'm going to research uh, and then pay that extra. And then they have a bigger bonus package uh, $400 will get you Ancestry, Fold3, newspaper.com. It's a bundle. 
And uh, once you get going and you're really an avid genealogist, that might be worth your investment. My Heritage is another paid newspaper.com. If you're looking for obits, I recommend them. There are, there's newspaper archives. That one's good too, but I find more on newspaper.com. Full3 is a military site. It has everything from uh, Indian Wars prior to the revolution, all the way up to our latest conflicts. Um, it keeps adding more and more. Um, I think it has most of the Revolutionary War. I'm waiting for Civil War records to be loaded onto it. It might be in a few more years before that happens. I think what they're working on too is the War of 1812. I think it's pretty close to complete. So that's another site you might want to visit or pay for. Or remember, you can use these free at the Family History Center over on Hearst Barn and Lynn Station. If you're not in Louisville, find a local Family History Center and see if you can't. Um, access some of these uh, paid websites. So in review here, we need to wrap it up so we have time for questions. Uh, do your homework, see what you've got available, or your cousins, all your relatives, try to pull as much as you can from them all. Decide how you're gonna organize, how you're gonna use web base, are you gonna, I strongly recommend you use some sort of software. Uh, what kind are you gonna use, you need to decide, and then go to it, start your research. So I should stop talking and let some of you share some questions or Phil maybe if he's awake. I, <laughs> I'm awake, Nancy. All uh, right, we have very, any questions? Very good, very good presentation. I'm an old timer in genealogy, but I learned a lot myself. Uh, we do have some uh, questions and uh, I think uh, uh, one or two of our Bettys uh, attempted to answer a couple of them. Uh, we have uh, one here from uh, Con Davis. It, she uh, says, hello, I have a genealogy question. Myself and my distant cousins are having a hard time on our great grandfather, John William Tracy. He was born in Louisville on 25th December, 1858 for his 1880 census, became an orphan in 1865, following the end of the Civil War. Uh, his father's name was also John Tracy, supposedly born in Ireland. His garden was Dr. Robert Pierce McMurdy of Elizabethtown, Hardin County, Kentucky. He is listed on the 1880 census with the uh, doctor who was his guardian. Three of my second cousins have done DNA and have found no one from his people. They feel that he must not have had any siblings. And uh, mm -hmm. so, uh, Khan, uh, in fact, I don't know if uh, Nancy has a question to clarify your question. Um, uh, did me... somebody else respond to her? Uh, not really. No. I would strongly suggest, I'm not sure, I think they have orphan um, records, is the Louisville Archives. And they have a lot of digital, they have an online catalog or a phone number, and they're more than willing to talk to you. And if they don't have those records, they would know where they might be if there are any. I know we have several orphanages that were in Louisville. Uh, so, do you, yeah, one, one thing that would help too, as far as orphanage is what religious faith they were, because I know there's Catholic orphanages and I don't know if there's any others here in Louisville, but I wouldn't be surprised. But the Louisville Metro Archives, Google that and give them a call or email them and see what they can do to help her out. That's my suggestion. Yeah, I, I uh, had a Civil War ancestor who uh, died in uh, Indiana and uh, his wife uh, actually became uh, mentally unstable because of that, because she had no support. Yeah. And the, the children did end up in an orphanage and uh, they were on uh, a list that was online in the, uh, some of the Indiana archives. So that is a good place to look. 
That's a good point because we are on the river and we border southern Indiana. So a lot of times you think, oh, they're from Kentucky, but they could have very easily, you're right, Phil, cross that river and be over in Indiana. Yeah. So you might want to look there too. Uh, we have a question also from Linda Brugg. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Is there a better genealogy website for family stories? Mm. Uh, Betty, one of the Bettys uh, said that she could add family stories, and I think you alluded to it on Family Search. Yes, uh, I do a lot of family stories. I've been trying to write a story a week, and I put my, I can attach my family stories to my person in the tree on Family Search. You can also attach all their photos, and you can also attach a uh, um, audio record if you're taping let's say you taped great grandma and you have her interview you can attach that too uh but i have uh stories but even on ancestry i'll put it into a pdf file and then upload it into their profile mm -hmm. so it's right there with that person so that's what i would recommend write up your stories i would convert it to a pdf file and then upload it to either ancestry family search is free and it's run by the church, it's not gonna go out of business. <laughs> so, and then the other place is the Allen County Public Library. They will take those family stories and they have a whole section that's all done by surname and you can send in, I mean, they're very uh, liberal on what kind of information. It could be uh, stories about great grandpa, it could just be notes from your genealogy records or it could be stories that you've written. So Allen County Public Library is an excellent place too to look, uh, to, to save uh, stories that you've written about your family. Yeah. Uh, and there was a question from Cheryl Harrington. Do you know if the library free version of Ancestry, uh, does it include the US or world? Good question. It includes both. It is a bonus that free. So if wow. you get if you have a library card and right now from any library, I would go to your local library, get that card. Well, you can't. You got I think Louisville, you can actually apply for a card online right now because I don't think you can get in the library. You can set it up. But if you have a library card and a password right now, you can access Ancestry and it's the world and US collection free to use right now. The library edition does not allow you to build trees. So it's, which is fine. As a researcher, you're just looking for records anyway. So yes, go for it. Use Ancestry right now because they're going to pull that back as soon as those libraries open up. So good yep. question. We have a question from Jane Norman. Uh, how do I object to Ancestry's no longer allowing printing of death certificates and census records? I didn't know that. I didn't either. Uh, it, oh. can can you use a screen capture? I mean, if you can see them on the screen, you should be able to use the uh, snip and save uh, yeah. To capture. Yeah, use. I would strongly recommend go into your accessories on your computer and and open up and put snip it on your computer and then just snip that page. You can just clip it. It won't it won't create the automatic. Um, citation for you, but you're going to have all the information if you clip it and get the top part of the census. Um, so there's ways you can get around that if they're not going to allow you to print it. You can clip it well, and print it yourself. Yeah, some, somebody uh, uh, gave an input that uh, said they were printing census records while watching this webinar. So yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. it may be a limitation that your computer is put on on your personal one. Uh, you can also download and print uh, if it won't let you print directly. That's a good idea. I like the download. Yeah. So if you're a paper, if, especially if you're still doing the paper, but remember you could download it and then store it digitally. You don't have to print it, but I know we still like to print. Then and I like the, the download. We have a uh, question from uh, James Patterson. Does the Louisville Genealogical Society have anyone will do, that will do some specific research for a fee? 
I am not, I am not retired, so I have a limited amount of time to do research of county resources, et cetera. Uh, I don't think we have a list of paid uh, researchers, but the Kentucky Genealogy Society has a lovely page of professional genealogists. So I would send you there. They're over in Frankfurt, uh, but you could just Google Kentucky Genealogical Society. And when you go to their webpage, their website, there's a, a tab somewhere there for paid genealogist or professional genealogist. Yeah, I don't think we have one right now. Uh, I think that, uh, wait a minute, we, get, we just got another one. Uh, <laughs> this, this is uh, from A, what is the legal ramification and ethical notice when asking the interview questions? Well, that's a good question too. And, and you have to use, I think, your own common sense and know when you're treading on delicate territory. Um, I think it's the responsibility of you as a genealogist to respect privacy of people. So if you ask a question and they're hesitant and they're not willing to get, you know, you just can't keep pumping them. I think that's unethical. Mm -hmm. um, if you know, I think it always ends up in territory where there's unwed mothers with children or several Y uh, partners. Um, you know, you, you can open up with a very broad question, but I would think ethically as a genealogist, you have to be very respectful of people's privacy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, uh, unless someone uh, has an additional question that they would like to ask Nancy, I think we're uh, finished with the uh, question and answer session. Uh, I'd, I'd also like to uh, remind everyone that uh, I have uh, recorded this session and uh, it will be posted on our website, I believe, by Howard Robertson, our webmaster, if we can work that out uh, with your, uh, you know, password of blogging to uh, LGS. But anyway, uh, you should check the website, uh, kylgs.org. Uh, Nancy showed it on her screen, and uh, there's information there on the next. Uh, yeah, there it is right there. It's, there's information on the next presentation. We uh, can't encourage you enough to keep track of things while you're uh, in quarantine for uh, our yes. information site. Back to yes. you. And thank you for coming and attending tonight and be safe and um, hope to see you in two weeks at our COVID-19 genealogy project workshop. There, Nancy, there was one question as to whether there was an outline for this presentation. Oh, there is a handout. Okay. And it's also, you said, uh, on the email that we sent out for the yes week. it was attached to that email yes all right very good okay okay thank you thank you <laughs>